Welcome to Real Life Real Gospel. I am your host, Josh Laborious. We are sponsored by St. Paul Lutheran Church and School here in Boca Raton, Florida, where I am recording right now. And if this is your first time listening, first of all, welcome. This is a show where we talk about the Christian faith and how and why and what it looks like when that impacts our regular life. This is a show where I do my best to avoid academic and theological language because I am intending to interact with reality and hopefully provide either guidance or advice or honestly questions about daily life and how our faith impacts that. This week we are discussing distractions and we're looking at um, how we should handle those. Are they good? Are they bad? What, what do we look like? This topic was suggested by Nathan Bozeman via Facebook. If you have any topics that you would like to hear about, that uh, you have questions about, that you want to hear me talk about, that you want to hear us discuss, um, feel free to submit them. Whatever platform you are listening, whether this is on Podbean or YouTube or Spotify, feel free to comment if that is a function that's available. If not, you can comment on Facebook or you can message me. You can email me, vicar at stpaulboca.com. And if you submit a topic, it is my intent. It is my uh, desire to get to those topics and and put them before you and, and look at them for you. So with that, to get into this distraction topic that we're going to be talking about, what I want to clarify first is what I'm talking about when I say distractions. Because distraction could be a very vague term. It is a very vague term. So to get a little more specific, when I'm talking about distractions, I'm talking about things that aren't really related to God directly. They're not really connected to our vocation, our calling, our uh, jobs, for lack of a better word. They take us away from reality. They take us away from what's in front of us. They don't lead us to the gospel. So at their core, when I'm talking about distractions, I'm talking about fruitless activities. Activities that don't really have a purpose or a goal. They are mindless on some level. And we're going to get into a little bit of what are examples of that. Some quick examples that I'm sure might come to mind quickly for you. Uh, They came to mind quickly for me. Just playing on your phone, whether that be games or uh, scrolling kind of without ingesting information or anything. Scrolling through social media or the news or whatever. Uh, watching TV, and other things can become distractions that we wouldn't really call distractions. So as we go forward, we're going to get into more of those, I guess, unexpected distractions. So with that background, with that lead up, this is Real Distractions, Real Gospel, presented by Real Life, Real Gospel. And as we always do, I want to start off by getting us into the scripture because, uh, To be frank, it has a lot better things to say than I do. So, our first reading comes from Joshua 1. And this is God speaking to Joshua. And he says, No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened. Do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So the textual notes that I want to put before you. First of all, I want to be very transparent, very honest. This is a call to Joshua. This is not directly to us. We have to... We have to see what it says to Joshua, see what it communicates about God, about our faith in that context, and then we can apply it to us. So what we can take out of this is this is what he calls leaders among his people to do. 
And on some level, I believe that makes it an example for each and every one of us because each and every one of us in some way is a leader among his people, whether that's we're leaders in our families or among our friends or uh, with peers or in our job. There is some way that each and every one of us leads, whether that's a formal leadership role or more of a, a mentorship role. We have this. So in in that regard, as leaders within God's people, this it, we can take a lot out of this text. It is an example for us. Um, just some additional notes on the text when it says this book of the law, what that is referring to is the collection of the teachings of God. So to Joshua, that would have meant something slightly different. But if I were to say, what is the book of the law for Christians today? We'd say the book of the law, the book of God's teachings of God's will is the Bible. And then finally, as we go through in the midst of all of these commands, there are promises throughout this text that are, are really cool to look at. There is success. There is, there is a promise for prosperity. All of this as a result of following God. So what can we take away from this? What can you and I take away from this speech, this speaking to Joshua? Well, one thing that I think is really valuable to take away is this line where he's told to meditate day and night on the book of the law, on God's word. So we can spend all of our time meditating on God's word. And you might say, I don't, I can't do that. I have a job. I have a family. I have friends that I like to attend to. I can't just sit and read the Bible all day. Me too. (laughs) I mean, Yes, I work at a church, but there are things that I have to do. I have to write sermons and write lessons, and I have to support my family, and my wife does appreciate it when I spend time with her. I get you. You can't just spend all day reading God's Word. That's not how it works. But what I would submit for you is it doesn't just say read God's Word, read the book of the law. God is saying meditate on it day and night. So what I would submit to you is that meditation on God's word includes the application, includes the living out of God's word. So this isn't a call to be a monk. This isn't a call to sit off by yourself and read God's word all the time. What this is a call to do is to keep God's will in sight in whatever you're doing. So if you are at work doing that to the best of your ability and honoring the people who are in authority over you, being honest, being transparent, not cheating, not lying. Um, All of these are ways to meditate on God's word through your work with your family. Meditation on God's word is treating your parents or your siblings or your kids with honor and with respect and with the love of God that he calls us to show to our families. And I would say that's meditation on God's word. And in, in all of these different realms, our friends, we show them God's love. R- meditation on God's word includes a reflection of what we know from God's word into our lives and impacting what we do. So that's kind of what it looks like to meditate on God's word in our family life and in our work. And one other thing that I think we should consider is how do we meditate on God's word through our leisure time? And one, I guess, obvious answer to that would be, well, we spend our leisure time reading the Bible, spending it in personal devotion, and that's great. I don't want to knock that. If if that's something you are able to do, if you are in a position, if you are of a disposition to do that, go for it. I encourage it wholeheartedly. But also, I think there are ways that we can reflect God's love, that we can meditate on God's word and act as he would have us act in the midst of things like watching TV, playing video games, um, hanging out with friends, playing board games, whatever your leisure time looks like. Because we are called to take that leisure time. Uh, Jesus says in the gospel that the Sabbath is made for man. God knew that We need, as human beings, we need rest. 
So leisure time, yes, it's it's healthy. It's good for us to take that rest. But it's important for us to do that in such a way that we are still in line with and meditating on God's word through our actions. So all of that is to say, what does this say about distractions? And my question for you to consider as you look at the various distractions in your life or how does it serve or how could it serve as meditation on God's word? Because it could very well put us in that place. Um, in that when we're being distracted, it, it kind of, it frees our mind up to kind of wander. And we can spend that, that wandering thinking about what God would have us be doing. For example, um, shower thoughts. Uh, when you when you're doing things like showering or driving or running, it's kind of an automatic thing that you're doing. It frees your mind up to kind of wander, and I think distractions can often do the same thing. For example, when I play video games, I don't necessarily have to think a lot about the video game at hand because a lot of it is very automatic, and we're not going to get too deep into that, but. There are a lot of things with sports, for example, a lot of it is just, for lack of a better word, it's instinct. What you're doing, and sometimes you have to think about it, yes, but it can provide a brain space or the act itself can be a meditation on God's word. If you're playing a sport and that's a distraction, um, that could easily become an opportunity to show God's love as you show good sportsmanship, as you play with honesty and respect. If you're playing video games, not being the guy who's on the mic being very rude, that could be a display of God's love, a meditation on God's word. You see, in every distraction, it can help put us into a place where we're either meditating on God's word or being a reflection of that meditation on God's word. At the same time, though, it can be something that takes us farther away from that place. So as you face distractions in your life, what I would encourage you to do, what I would hope that you could do, would be to reflect, is this putting me closer to meditation on God's word? Or is this something that's taking me away from it? For example, if a distraction for you is watching the news and you get really riled up and agitated and angry about it, I would say maybe that's taking you further away from God's word. But if it's something where you see God's work in the world and you're looking at the news and you see God's work in the world through that, I would say that's phenomenal. Keep it up. So the the reality, the real life that I want to take out of this passage from Joshua is um, that distractions are anywhere, are anywhere and everywhere. And some present a temptation. And some present a draw away from God's will and God's word. However, the gospel that I have in this is that it's, it gives us, Joshua is giving us, God through Joshua is giving us God's word as a point of focus, as an opportunity for us to focus and meditate on God's word day and night. And I think the gospel message that I have for you is that some distractions can be a way to draw us to God, to draw us to his will and a meditation and an application of God's will. So if, if you came to this podcast kind of thinking that I was going to do nothing but say, oh, we should avoid distractions, I'm not going to say that because I do think some distractions can bring us closer to God, can provide us an opportunity for meditation on God's word, even if it's not just reading the Bible and doing devotion. So that's what I would put before you based on Joshua. And with that, I want to drive us into the gospel, into Luke, and we have Luke 10, because I, I am uplifting some distractions, but Luke 10 does provide us with a warning about distractions. And Luke 10 says, Now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, 
You are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. So the textual notes that I have for you today are first and foremost telling you that Martha was doing the thing that at the time society would have approved of. She was working to take care of the guests of the house. Hospitality was incredibly important in the society that they lived in. So the fact that Mary was shirking her her duty to show hospitality, Martha would have been right. So what Jesus is saying is countercultural here. You see, the expectation would be that, yes, Jesus would have rebuked Mary. And that's, that's not what he does. So as we go forward, there's a reflection into our lives. And I think a very direct reflection into our lives in that we, in a lot of ways, are like Martha. There are expectations in our lives, very re, uh, real and realistic expectations. And we don't ignore those. We don't ignore those. But this is a reminder to choose the good portion. So in that first segment, I guess, from the Old Testament, we see that distractions can be a good thing. But here I would say we have to be careful that they don't become negative, that they don't draw us away from the good portion. And that is God. That is Jesus Christ. That is Christian fellowship. So distractions can be good, but not at the expense of God. So if you are getting distracted and it's taking so much of your time that you don't have time in your day for personal devotion for prayer, I would say you're at a place where you should cut back on those distractions. You should remove some of those from your life. And if you have a distraction like a sport or something that is a little more serious that takes up a little more time and it's causing you to do things like be too busy or tired on Sunday morning to go to church, then maybe that's a distraction that you should pack back away from. If it's keeping you out of Bible study, if it's keeping you out of fellowship and community with other people, I, I would say you draw back. Because in reality, at the end of our days, at the end of our lives, when you and I and everyone we know is dead, what is really going to matter? The distractions that you're holding on to because they bring you some level of enjoyment or peace? Or is that relationship that you're building with Christ going to matter? And I know that sounds hard and that sounds like uh, a really tough teaching because it is. But in reality, when you die, we're going to want to have that relationship on solid ground. We're going to want to have done everything in our life to strengthen our faith rather than spending that time playing on our phones or whatever other your distraction comes to mind for you, watching TV, uh, playing video games, playing board games. I, I don't know what you do for distraction. Um, and all of this is to say, distractions might have a purpose. For example, if you play in a recreational sports league, you might have a purpose in that. There is physical fitness. If you have a, a bowling league, a knitting club, a scrapbooking group, a reading, a book club, that's what they're called. They're book clubs. That might have a good purpose. But it shouldn't be at the expense of God because ultimately... Everything can be a distraction. So what we have to ask in the midst of almost everything we do is what is driving it? What is the motivation for that action? And what does it result in? What is the end goal? What is the end purpose? And the, the reality, the real life truth that I want to take out of this is we are expected to participate in certain distractions. We are kind of societally expected to know what's going on in the news, to know what the latest TV shows are, to listen to music, to play sports, to be involved in the community, to be involved with, with people and doing things and keeping busy. 
And there are a lot of demands on our attention and our time. And all of these demands can become nothing more than distractions when we put them in perspective. And we're called to disengage from those and focus on God. And that is a tough ask. That is a tough thing to ask of people. The real gospel, though, is that God can work in the midst of these distractions. And gospel connections can be made in each and every one of them. They almost become necessary distractions. Because these are our opportunities, our opportunities to share the gospel with the world. And to show what a gospel life looks like. And we're getting back to that Old Testament where we're spending all of our time meditating on God's word. The trick is to keep them in balance. And strategies for doing that might be keeping a calendar and being pretty specific. And limiting the time that you spend with certain distractions, whatever they may be. And as we do that, I, I want it to drive us directly, that gospel... Um, I want it, us to drive directly into Galatians. Galatians 5 tells us, But I say, walk in the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality. Impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalry, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us all keep also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. So this is Paul's message to the Galatians, and you might say, what does that have to do with distractions? And I'm coming from that same place that we kind of, we closed if um, our gospel on, is that we got to keep this in balance and we got, we have to cling to what is good and put out what is bad. So just going forward, some textual notes. Um, when we're talking about spirit versus flesh, I want to be clear that this is, Almost, it's a, a metaphor. That's not the right word, but that's the word I'm going to use. In that a spirit, the spirit refers to what is of God. The Holy Spirit, things that are of God, compared to the flesh, which is sinful nature. Which represents, reflects our corrupted, sinful selves. The reason I make this distinction is because I don't want for us to be confused saying that the body is bad. Because the body is God's creation. We are called to take care of it. It is important. And when we are on the last day, when God, when Jesus returns and there is a new heaven and a new earth, our bodies are going to be part of that. So our bodies are not evil. I I don't want to draw a line between body and soul. So that's why I point out that when it's talking about the spirit um, and acts of the spirit, and fruits of the Spirit, it's talking about things that are of God, not necessarily drawing a line between body and soul, if, if that makes sense. I hope that's helpful. Um, so we would say, how does this apply to distractions? It's, this helps us to, to set that balance that I talked out a minute ago. Is, and as we look at distractions, is it a work of the Spirit of God, or is it a work of the flesh? Walk by the Spirit. If a distraction is of the Spirit... That's good. Keep it in your life. It's good for, for it to be there. But if a distraction is of the flesh, then we should do our best to cut it out. And my, my strategies for you for walking by the Spirit would be, we're looking for gradual changes. And I'm going to go all the way back to our first segment when we're talking about meditating on God's Word. 
that meditation, if we are if we are both doing it through our actions, but also literally we are looking at God's word on a regular basis, eventually that will seep into our lives because there is incredible power in the word. And there's a phrase that I learned while I was studying education. We, we used to say, caught, not taught. Most of the things that students learn are caught, not taught. They're things they pick up, not necessarily things that are taught to them. Whether it's by seeing or by experiencing, whatever that is. So what I would say is, as we meditate on God's word, as we seek to apply it in our lives, and read it, and devote to it, and all of these different things, eventually we're going to catch those things of the spirit and they will push out the things of the flesh. So look for those gradual changes. And that's my strategy for you is don't expect to be a new person overnight. That's not how any of this works, but we look for those gradual changes. And if we carefully examine things as we are distracted by them, then we can make those decisions in a case by case basis. So the, Reality, the real life that I want to close on is there are temptations in the midst of all of our distractions. And there are things that we shouldn't engage with. And Galatians talks about those things that we shouldn't engage with. So my question for the distractions that we're considering is, is it one of the things that we shouldn't engage with? Or does it cause one of the things we shouldn't engage with? All of these evil, broken behaviors that we have, the anger, the fits of rage, sexual immorality, um, whatever these immoral actions are, do distractions play into those? Do they lead to those? And if that's the case, we should be cutting those distractions out. But the real gospel that I want to close on is that the Spirit works in us and the Spirit can work through these things. The Spirit of God can work through all of these things. So the long and the short, the too long didn't read summary of this podcast of how Christians should interact with distractions are, if those distractions can drive us to the gospel, can provide an opportunity to meditate on God's word through our actions, then I would say those distractions can be good things in our lives. If they're providing mental breaks that are good for our mental health, then they are good things in our lives. If they are driving us to to wicked behaviors, if they're causing us to neglect our vocations, our callings as family members, as friends, as children of God, as employees, if they're causing us to draw away from those or do perform poorly in those areas, then I would say we need to push them away. We need to call, we need to rein them in, call them back. That is a case by case basis. So the questions we need to ask as we look at our various distractions are, is this supporting the gospel or is this leading me away from what God's will for my life is? And as you approach all the distractions in your life, that is the question that I hope and I pray that you ask and can answer for yourself. Because it is going to be a little bit individualized. It's going to look different for different people. So that's what I want to close on. So the real life reality of distractions is that they're there And they're probably not going away anytime soon. And it's something we have to deal with. But the gospel I want to close you on is that God's going to work through the distractions in our lives too. God is more powerful than any distraction that we have in our life. So we can can trust that his forgiveness is there for us when we mess up, when we are distracted by things we shouldn't. And that he'll work through distractions in ways that we can't even imagine. This has been episode six of Real Life, Real Gospel. I am so thankful that you joined me for it. Again, I have been your host, Josh Laboris. We look forward to future weeks and future podcasts. We do release podcasts every Thursday, and we release it on iTunes, on Spotify, on YouTube, on Google Podcasts, on Podbean. So whatever your preferred platform is to listen to these podcasts, go ahead and subscribe. We love to see those subscriptions, and it, it does give us a little bit of validation of what we're doing here. And If you have any topics that you would like us to talk about in the future, feel free to submit them in the comments. Or again, my email is vicar at stpaulboca.com if that is something that you want to connect with. With that, this has been Real Life, Real Gospel. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.